video. The thing about live videos, the fun thing is sometimes you gotta wait for somebody to come on. But if they watch it after the fact, then it's just a whole bunch of silence at first. I'm still trying to figure out. Okay. So I want to be able to see comments. And sometimes I worry that I don't have it where comments are showing up. Especially whenever I say feel free to interact. <laughs> right? So I am more nervous about this than I have been with just about anything I've ever went live with because it's a contentious thing and I don't know how it's going to go because I'm live. So I just got to roll with it. <laughs> if I talk myself into a corner, just bear with me, all right? But if you know me, whenever I go live, I got to do this just to kill a little bit of time before I start, just give people a chance to get on. I always have a drink ready, always non-alcoholic, I promise. A lot of people are going to judge me for this, but I'm going with Monster this time. Just to kind of... Oh my gosh, Derek, you're, you're drinking Monster and it's Mark of the Beast and Illuminati. Like, okay, whatever. But here's the thing, Here, here's something really cool. <laughs> um, Back when I was an admin in Reasons for Jesus, I would go live in the admin group to give teachings and I would always pop a drink open like I just did, but I did this thing where I would blow the shofar. Like if you're familiar with in scripture, whenever it says the blowing of the trumpet, this is what they're talking about right there. So I'm going to get started right now with a blow of the trumpet. And this is the part that I could probably fail miserably. So <laughs> I'm going to do it till I get it right. Rusty on it. I used to blow this thing all the time, but uh, not so much anymore. All right, so I want to know if I can see comments or not before I start. No, I don't want to do that. Let me push this button, type a comment, see if it shows up. There it is. Okay, so I can see comments. Uh, that was just the first letter I pushed. I got things holding this up, so I can't. I, my reach on the keyboard wasn't very good. So anyway, um, I'm just going to get started right now. I'm talking about soteriology, where I stand on the whole debate. Uh, for those of you who have been following me on this, I've been reading through different soteriological books. I read through ten of them: three from Calvinists, three from Arminians, three from Traditionalists, and Norman Geisler's book. So a lot of people were following me with that, and I just figured, hey, since I, since I did all that, I come to the end. I'm not done with soteriology by any means, trust me. I'm basically just getting started, but for those who had been following me so far, hey, Derek, where does your soteriology stand? Three books of Calvinism, Arminianism, Traditionalism, and then Geisler's book. Where's your soteriology? Well, that's what I'm going to go over today. I cut a lot out. Like, I was seriously writing down. I was just going to throw everything at the wall on where I stand. And I just couldn't do it because I felt like it would have been, like, an hour and a half long. And I just don't I don't want to do that. I don't want to put anybody through that. So, um, I'm just going to be boom, boom, boom. I'm going to talk so much. I'm going to talk fast. But it is what it is because I want to get through this. But I also want to hit all the high points that I want to hit that are part of this contentious debate. So, as we start talking about soteriology, um, why don't I define things the way I see them, okay? The first one, election. Derek, do you believe in the doctrine of election? I do, because it's in scripture. Election is in scripture. The way I see election is threefold. There's election to service, there's election um, of, of a group of people, and then there's the people in the church, right? And so, Election to service. I th I think when God chose Abraham to be the progenitor to the the you know the people of God that would give the Messiah, He elected Abraham for that service for those promises. Then J Isaac, then Jacob, and then you go further down to Judah, then David, all the way to Christ. Right. 
That's election to service, election of, of a group of people. That was Israel. Israel is God's elect of the Old Testament. Uh, you got that in Deuteronomy. You got that in Isaiah, in the Septuagint, the Greek, the Greek translation of the Hebrew. The word eklektos is applied multiple times to Israel. That's the same word in the New Testament that we translate elect or chosen. Okay, So Israel was God's elect in the Old Testament. And then, of course, you have to ask yourself, okay, so was all Israel saved? No. Obviously not, because we had the, the, the exile. So, Israel was God's elect. Not all Israel was saved, because, in my opinion, election doesn't mean elected, chosen to be saved, right? That's not what the scripture is talking about, in my opinion. Um, even in passages like Matthew 24, you know, the all of that discourse, he mentions the elect three times. And I think all three of those are referring to Israel, because you have the Jewish gospel, preached by our Jewish Messiah to a Jewish audience, when they hear the elect, they're thinking Israel, all right? And I think there's other examples of it, but then I think there's other examples in Scripture where the elect are those who are in Christ, right? I don't, I don't the Calvinist idea that, that all the elect will be saved and all the saved were elect and there's a one-to-one -one ratio, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't think that's what election is. Armenians sometimes do that too, but they parse how the election works, like when, when it applies, when you're considered elect, all that stuff. It's different, but a lot of them do that, but then there's Armenians who hold to the corporate view like, like I just espoused. Um, what about predestination? Well, I'll get into the election more whenever I talk about Ephesians 1. Um, predestination, I'll get more into that with Ephesians 1 and Romans 8, but I don't see predestination being predestined to be saved. Right. That's not what I, that's not how I would define predestination. I believe it is a promise for those who are saved. Those who are saved are predestined for certain promises. Um, when it comes to sovereignty, Calvinists oftentimes define sovereignty in terms similar. I'm not going to say like like hard and fast, but similar language kind of implying meticulous determinism, meticulous control. Right. That that every every tiny detail. Um, R.C. Sproul says that if there's one rogue molecule that God's not controlling, then he's not sovereign, okay? I don't define sovereignty like that. I define it by the standard dictionary definition. God does what he wants. He has authority. He does as he pleases. Psalm 115, Psalm 135, he sits in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. He does whatever he pleases on the, in the heavens and on the earth. He just does what he wants. He can do anything, including allow for free creatures, Right? Then we get into monergism versus synergism. Honestly, I consider myself a monergist, but I think the whole label thing is just a convoluted mess used to rhetorically bend the debate into certain people's favor. That's how I see monergism versus synergism, so I don't like them. But if you want to take them at their, at their root definition, mono, which means one, and Forgot the, I forgot the, 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 the second part, like the original, but inter, anyway, monergism means one person working. Synergism means two people cooperating to work. Uh, salvation is 100% God. God does 100% of the work of salvation, right? 100% of it. None does man contribute to his salvation. And having faith, trusting the Lord, that is not adding to your salvation. That doesn't do anything because God still doesn't have to save you just because you have faith. He chose that that will be the condition, but he, he did all the work. Faith isn't a work. Faith is not a work. It is contrasted with works. It's the opposite of works. So the fact that we trust in Jesus Christ when we hear the gospel, that God's still doing all the work of saving, right? He gives us the grace, right? Um, <clears throat> he gives us the grace. He gives us, he gives us the atonement. He, he's the one who gets us born from above. Like he seals us with the Holy spirit. All of that is God. Us trusting does not contribute to that. So I will go with monergism. Some people will define synergism. James White did on Twitter just recently. Synergism is basically the exact same as Calvinism. They're synonymous in his view. So in that, yeah, sure. I'm synergist, whatever. Um, and then there's the whole Pelagian versus semi-Pelagian thing. Here's the thing. Armenian, Calvinist, traditionalist, all three, none of them are Pelagian or semi-Pelagian. Um, God, it's like Pelagian is like man can come to God on his own. Semi-Pelagian is like God comes so far and then man has to come the rest of the way. None of them believe that. I'm reading their literature and I'm telling you none of them believe that. They believe it is all of grace, right? All the work of God. So none of them are semi-Pelagian or Pelagian. Whenever I hear Sproul or James White talk about Armenians, like they, they'll use semi-Pelagian and Armenian interchangeably, it's garbage. But 
that's just me. So, oh, let me take a breather. Because that was a lot of talking. And I'm, I'm only just getting started. Dead in sin. Let's talk about that because this is where Calvinists get a lot of people to kind of really consider their view. Wherever they can break it down like this. So Ephesians 2.1 as for you, you were dead in sins, in, or you were dead in your transgressions and sins. What the Calvinist says, there you are lying down like a corpse, right? And you can't tell a corpse, get up and go to the hospital to be made well, right? Because a corpse can't believe, a corpse can't do righteous things, a corpse can't believe on the, they can't hear the gospel, right? What can a dead man do is the, is the question that's often asked. Then they'll point to John 3.3. 3. Uh, da, 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 da. John 3, 3 says, um, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So what they'll say is that you're lying there corpse-like, but then God, you know, gives you that new life. You are born again through regeneration. And they'll say, they'll use uh, 1 John 5, 1 as well to kind of convey this point. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So they're saying that, that you are born of God so that you may believe in Jesus Christ, your corpse, then you're born again in order to be able to believe. And then Ephesians 2, 5, Sproul loves pointing this one out, um, uh, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. You're laying there and then God infuses you with this life, brings you to life so that you may believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll use the picture of Lazarus coming out of the tomb the resurrection, they'll say that Jesus stood there at the tomb and he called out Lazarus and he was, life came back into him at the, at the hearing of Christ's powerful, effectual call, comes out of the tomb of, of a man who's alive, right? Resurrected from the dead, basically. And so that's the Calvinist idea of being dead in sin. However, I don't agree with that. I don't think that that's the correct way to look at dead in sin scripturally because they'll say, what does a dead man do, right? So once again, Ephesians 2, 1, as for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins. What can a dead man do? I'll tell you what they can do. Go to verse 2. Go to the next verse where it says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desire, its desires and thoughts like the rest. So being dead in sin does not mean that you are passed out, you know, just a corpse that can't do anything. A corpse or people who are dead in sin, they can reject Jesus. They can sin. They can live according to the enemy. They can live according to their flesh and the thoughts of their mind, right? So it's not corpse likeness. It was never meant to be that way. Um, plus, They'll often say that um, that you're dead in sin, therefore you can't do anything righteous, you can't do any good work whatsoever, and that uh, that you're, you were just bound to sin and all you can do is sin, everything is sin, right? Well, Romans 6.11 says you're dead to sin, right? You have died to sin. So does that mean if you're saved you can't sin? Like you are a corpse whenever it comes to sin? No, that's not what it means. That's not what it's talking about. Um, John 8, 34 says you're a slave of sin. So they're like, like a slave can't free himself. You're a slave to sin. Everything you want to do, your thoughts, your desires are all bent towards sin. Yeah, sure. I'm okay with that. We are slaves of sin when we are unregenerate. However, Romans 6, 19 says you're a slave of righteousness whenever you're saved. Does that mean when you're a slave of sin, you can't do anything righteous? So does that mean when you're a slave of righteous, you can't do anything that's sinful? No, right? If you're going to have it one way, you have to have it the other. Um, and, so, and I'm not saying that you can work for your salvation. Don't take it that way. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that they can do enough good to be saved. They can contribute to their salvation. That's not the point I'm making. I'm saying, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just making a point that it's not like an absolute corpse-like dead kind of thing. Um, I would rather use the prodigal son to illustrate this. They, the Calvinists use Lazarus. The problem with that is Lazarus is never once used as a picture of salvation. Never once. That is something that's read into the text. I like to use the parable of the prodigal son because he takes his father's inheritance, goes to a distant land, squanders it, and you know he's brought low and poor in spirit. And then he, the scriptures say he comes to his senses, right? And then he comes back and throws himself at the mercy of his father, and his father embraces him, kisses him, and then he says, my son, you were dead, but is alive again. Or my son is dead, but is alive, was dead, and is alive again, sorry. And um, so that kind of clues you in on what does dead in sin mean? It means you are separated, you are estranged from God. The prodigal son was estranged from his father. He was dead to him, right? Um, and you see this in Revelation 3 when Jesus is talking to the church of Sardis. When he rebukes him, he says, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. He does not mean you are laying there like a corpse that needs life injected 
related to them. He's saying, you are estranged from me. There is separation. Also, just to kind of really add this point, Scripture does say we're dead in sin, but it also uses sickness to illustrate this too. Jeremiah 17, 9. Calvinists love this passage, right? And it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Okay? Oh, well, maybe that doesn't say it. How about this? How about this? Mark 2, 17. Uh, da on hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Sinners is paralleled with the sick, not the dead there. In other words, Scripture uses deadness. Scripture uses estrangement. It uses sickness. It uses different illustrations to convey that we are estranged from God, right? Um, and that, you know, three, the Synoptic Gospels all say, mention that um, quote from Jesus. Um, Plus, the whole thing doesn't really make sense when you think about it, the Calvinist understanding, because you're born dead, you're a corpse, you can't see, hear, and understand anything, because what can a dead man do? But then it says, Jesus says that he was speaking in parables to the Pharisees to hide the truth from them, to fulfill prophecy of hardening their hearts, so that they could not see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and turn to him so that they may have life. So they're a corpse, then Jesus blinds them through speaking in parables, and then 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that the God of this age has blinded their eyes. So it's like, what are they, triple blinded? Or are they a corpse with double blindfolds? Like, it doesn't make sense. So you need to take everything within its, its immediate context. You can't just build entire systems of doctrines on little analogies used to talk about how we stand before a holy God when we're unregenerate. But the other thing is, you know, Calvinism, not all Calvinism, but typical modern-day Calvinism, Sproul, White, uh, the guys who wrote Why I'm Not an Arminian, I forget their name. Um, regeneration precedes faith. That is, that is like Sproul's big thing. The axiom of the, the Reformation is regeneration precedes faith. I disagree. I think faith comes first, right? Because um, they use John 3.3, 3, you must be born again, right? Uh, let me read that for you real quick. Again, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, that unless, unless you're saying, like, you got to insert, like, it doesn't say anything about faith in there. It doesn't say one thing about faith. So you can't have an order so, ordo salutis with faith involved just based on that. In other words, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. What is the kingdom of God? Is it the eschatological kingdom of God that Israel was expecting at this time? He was talking to a Pharisee, right? Um... Is it, is it that Jesus was among them as the kingdom of God, like it says in Luke 17? Maybe, but the whole point is that it's it, like, it's not, you can't say that, oh, in order to be saved, you have to be born again, right? Or you could say that, but then it's like the logical order is like faith, born again, saved, you know, justified. Like, I can still, like, this isn't a good text to, to promote pre-faith regeneration. It's just not. First John 5, 1, I already read that, but let me read it again. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. They're saying that and like they were born of God to believe. Everyone who believes was born of God, right? So born again came first before belief, right? Brian Abashano has talked about this at length. He's a Greek scholar. Um, when you analyze the Greek of 1 John 5, 1, there is no order there. It's not saying one came before the other. It's just that, that the people who do this, you can say this about them, right? But, but there's no order which one came first. So 1 John 5, 1. Um, there are, you know, R.C. Sproul, like I said, Ephesians 2, 5, when we were dead in sin and trespasses, he made us alive again in Christ. I mean, that doesn't, that does that has nothing to do with the order either, because at some point you were dead and at another point you were alive. Some, at some point that had to happen, but faith is never mentioned and when it plays a part there. So that's also not a good, um, analogy and like a, or good proof text. And like I said, Lazarus is never equated to salvation. He's actually a picture of resurrection because Jesus is the resurrection and he was going to resurrect to vindicate his self as the Messiah and God in the flesh. But, um, I have a few things I want to read here. Regeneration comes after faith. Um, if any of these texts flip the order, Calvinists would have basically like a knockdown argument for regeneration preceding faith, but that's not what you're going to see here. Ezekiel 18, 30 through 32, therefore you Israelites, I will judge you, each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord, repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord, repent and live, repent and live. Notice that. He said, rid yourselves of the offenses you committed, get a new heart and a new spirit. Acts eleven eighteen. 18, 
When they heard this, they had no further objection and praised God, saying, So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Repentance unto life. Um, John 5.40, Jesus tells the Pharisees, Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Come to Jesus to have life. John, uh, a few verses later in verse 53 of John 6, I tell you the truth, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. you that's, that's a picture of believing in him. If you don't do that, then you will have no life in you. Uh, John 6, 57, uh, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. The order clearly laid out is, you know, to believe, faith, and then live. Um, John 20, 31, this is, this is, about as clear as it can get. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Believing you may have life. Imagine, imagine if it said, you will be given life so that you may believe. Imagine any verse said something that clearly, but it doesn't. By believing you, you may have life. Acts 15, 9, he made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. They were, they were regenerated by faith, not unto faith. Uh, John 1, 12 through 13, Calvinist love, John 1, 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those he be who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children not born of natural descent or of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. If you take away that middle part, it's basically saying he gave, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. They believed, then they were given the right to become children of God, meaning born of God. Um... Ephesians 1.13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal of the promise of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3, verses 2 and 5, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So again, I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? So you believe, then you're given the Spirit, and the Spirit brings life. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 16, but their minds were made dull for to this day. He's talking about the, the Jews here. He's talking about Israel. But their minds were made dull for to this day. The same veil remains. When the old covenant is read, it has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. Catch this. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.16, but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ, may display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Believe and receive eternal life. It is clearly a cause and effect relationship there. Colossians 2.12, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working God who raised him from the dead. You were raised through faith, right? Not raised unto faith as regeneration preceding faith would, would suggest. Last one, James 1.18, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of all he created. Birth through the word of truth. Believing the word of truth, we are born again. So that's what I have to say about being dead in sin, regeneration, all that stuff. Let me take another. All right, let's talk about free will. This will be a fun one. I say this, it's going to come off, Calvinists aren't going to like how I say this, because I've said it before and I got a lot of flack. If I can say this with all the sincerity and love in my heart, Reformed teachers and preachers do a very terrible job of teaching what libertarian free will is. They have badly dropped the ball on this. Just saying. Just saying. There are some who do fine with it. Guillaume Bignon, you probably haven't even heard of him. He's a Calvinist philosopher, holds to compatibilism. He knows what libertarian free will is. He correctly represents it. He's a good dude. But I'm talking about those guys that you're listening to on YouTube in the pulpits and you know podcasts. They, they just dropped the ball on this. Um, free will. It is not spontaneous, R.C. Sproul. It is not random. It is not the ability to do anything. It is not 100% of the time. Like, I believe that God has all the freedom in the world to override somebody's libertarian free will if he chooses to. I think that's exactly what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. We can talk about the hardening of Pharaoh and the Jews in the New Testament. Um, it doesn't mean you can choose to never sin. Uh, it doesn't mean you can choose against your nature. Not even God chooses against his nature. Um, it doesn't mean you can thwart God's sovereignty. That's None of that is free will. Uh, 
I'll just say this. Tim Stratton has a very simplistic definition. This is a simplistic definition. It, de it can be qualified further um, for different situations, but generally libertarian free will is the ability to choose from a range of options, each of which is consistent with one's nature. In other words, there is a range. There is multiple options one could choose, right? Um, no, no secret, I'm a Molinist. Um, Molinists, I mean, they can get, talk about philosophically deep, they know their stuff. So if you want to look into libertarian free will, what it actually is, not how it's, I have never seen a reformed teacher or preacher get it right. I've never seen it. Okay. So take that coming from me saying, I would suggest lovingly that if you want to learn about what it actually is, if you want to correctly understand your, your opposition to this, Look into different Molinists, freethinkingministries.com. That's Tim Stratton. That's where I got that. William Lane Craig. Uh, I'm planning a, you got lots of Molinists out there. Uh, Kirk McGregor. I mean, just lots of people you can learn from. Look in, if you want to learn about free will, learn about it from people who actually believe it, okay? Not from people who disagree with it. That, that wouldn't be fair, all right? Proverbs 18, 13, Proverbs 18, 17. Um, compatibilism is what typical Calvinists hold to nowadays. R.C. Sproul. Jonathan Edwards, James White, I mean, they're all pretty much compatibilists. They don't use that term oftentimes, and they also don't parse it out to what it actually means. They kind of veil it in understandable language without getting into the nitty-gritty details of it. Compatibilism is you are free to choose according to your greatest desire, right? So it is free will in the, in the respect that you can choose according to your greatest desire. However, your will, what you, your greatest desire, your will, is determined. So that's how God can determine your will but you're free to choose according to your will. That's how determinism and free will can be compatible. That's compatibilism. Whenever you hear somebody like R.C. Sproul say that you choose according to your greatest desire at the moment of decision, he's talking about compatibilism. Compatibilism is a form of determinism. Determinism, hard determinism is a type where you're basically a meat puppet. You don't make your decisions. God makes you do everything you do, right? Um, compatibilism takes it a step back, right? So you do freely choose according to your greatest desires, right? And um, sorry, I just got a comment. Now I'm distracted. <laughs> don't, don't worry about that. Comment as, as you want. But uh, incompatibilism, monergism.com itself says that uh, compatibilism is no less deterministic than hard determinism because the result is still the same. At the moment of decision, you have one option you can choose. You don't have another option. When you sin, that sin that you hated, that you committed, you could not have chosen otherwise at that moment of decision, right? Uh, the, the thoughts in your mind, you know, you, you may feel like you're, you're, you're weighing options and going different places to come up with different beliefs. That's all determined. You were determined to go to one option there your because your desires are determined by God, um, either through secondary or tertiary or even further removed causes. Um, and, you know, when somebody sins against you, when you're a victim of abuse, no matter what, that person could not have chosen otherwise in that moment of decision. They were determined to make that choice. That's why compatibilism is no less deterministic than hard determinism. But the, the reason a lot of Calvinists hold to that is because they want to say that God is sovereign over it. So he determines your will. So he's sovereign in this whole process. But he's removed because there's secondary causes that he utilizes in order to get you to choose according to his will. Right. And so. That, that separation into the tertiary, secondary, you know, whatever causes allows God to not be the author of sin. He's removed from it and you're fully responsible because you're freely choosing according to your greatest desire. That's compatibilism um, in a very simplistic nutshell. Uh, but the thing is, I get this a lot from people who disagree with libertarian free will. They say you always choose according to your greatest desire. No matter what you say, no matter what choice you make, even if you feel like you hated that decision, you didn't want to make it, you still chose according to your greatest desire at the moment of decision. I can even grant that. That's not where the debate centers around because then I can just say, okay, can my desires change? Before the moment of decision, can my desires change? My greatest desire is, is going to lead me to this choice, but can I do reason and uh, through, through uh, reason and uh, rationality, can I think about things, weigh the options, change my desire and choose something else. Can I do that? If so, libertarian free will is still intact even if we choose according to our greatest desires at the moment of the decision. But the other implication of compatibilism, the Calvinist compatibilism, is that your choices, 
Whenever you make a choice and you feel like you could have made a different choice, that's an illusion. That's not true. You could not have made a different choice. Whenever you are reasoning in your mind and, and practicing rationality and coming to different conclusions and you know weighing options and all that to come to a belief, to come to a decision, something like that, it feels like you could have went other ways, but that's an illusion. You only could have went one way with that because of the causes, you know, the, the, the chain of effect that led up to that point. You could not have done anything else in the moment of decision. Libertarian free will says that you could. Even, and, and I know that Calvinists don't like it whenever you make it simplistic like this, but even the decision, okay, tomorrow, whenever I'm choosing my breakfast, I could have Cheerios, I could have Frosted Flakes, each of which is consistent with my nature. Whichever one I choose, I could not have chose the other one in compatibilism. I could not have. I could only have chose that. That is the implication of compatibilism, okay? And so that's what kind of gets some Calvinists to basically take a position where it's almost like you have libertarian free will, except whenever it comes to positive spiritual things and salvation. But then, I mean, you're basically an Arminian at that point. And that's the irony of it, because that's practically what Arminians believe in large part. So it's, it's you know, um, then we got to consider Genesis three. OK, so Adam and Eve fell. Calvinists are all over the map on this one, too. Hold on. So, some say we had libertarian free will. I think I think even Spurgeon's on this camp. We had free will. Then we chose to fall, and our will became fallen, and now we're like compatibilistically free. Okay, and that's fine. But then you have to forfeit this idea that libertarian free will can't exist. Well, obviously it can if we had it before the fall. You would have to forfeit uh, this this notion that God can't be sovereign if we have libertarian free will. Well, apparently, are you saying God wasn't sovereign whenever the fall happened? I mean, that's the implications of that are huge. So I don't really see that. Plus, I mean, Scripture doesn't ever actually say like like whenever Adam and Eve fell. Where in the curses does it say that their their free will was affected? I can say it was affected, but 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 fallen to such a deterministic level. Like that's not that's not there. So then they'll say, oh, okay, so maybe compatibilism throughout. But then you have to wrestle with the fact that God determined them to fall. Like, through compatibilistic means, even if it was secondary, tertiary, further removed, God set that domino chain into effect to have one result, which was Adam eating of the fruit. And so I don't know how you avoid super lapsarian with that. Um, and then other people just say mystery. Whatever. I, I just say Adam and Eve made a libertarian free choice. And they felt we still have libertarian free will, but our capacity, those, that range of options is constricted. Um, and then, hey, if, if God knows what you're going to eat for breakfast tomorrow, you have to eat that. You can't eat anything else because then God would be wrong and God can't be wrong. So how can you say you have free will if you have to eat this tomorrow? This is the modal logic fallacy. Um, essentially, what it gets wrong is that I could still eat something different tomorrow. I could... If I'm weighing between Cheerios and Frosted Flakes, God knows I'm going to eat Cheerios. I could eat Frosted Flakes. I could. That is within my abilities. I could have chosen Frosted Flakes, but I'm not going to. I won't do that. It doesn't mean I can't do that. It's I won't do that. That's the difference between certainty and necessity. God knows the future with certainty, but not of necessity, right? And essentially, he knows our free choices because that's what we're going to choose. We don't choose it because he knows it, right? They, they have it backwards. So there is no, there is no conflict there, but you know what? This whole discussion of free will is whatever. Why don't we just go to what the scriptures say? First Corinthians 10, 13 is a beautiful example because it says that no temptation has overcome you, which is not common to man. And it's like, anytime you're tempted, God gives you a way out, right? So anytime you sin scripture, scripture inspired by the Holy spirit says you could have chosen otherwise. Anytime you sin, because God provided a way out. Compatibilism does not allow for that. You could only have chosen what you were compatibilistically determined to do. So in my opinion, scripture wipes away any determinism. In cases like that, James 4.2, you have not because you ask not. That implies that God was ready and willing and able to provide. You didn't ask, right? And so that, that to me, that implies that you could have asked because he was... If you would have asked, he would have provided. I don't, I, it just doesn't make sense to say, oh, if you would have asked, I would have given it to you. But I determined you not to ask. You know, like, like that's, that's, that's why people, I don't start with free will and then, you know, judge God based on my free will. I start with God and none of this makes sense unless I have free will, right? So I reason to it because I, I feel like the intellectual 
price of denying free will is way too high, and I don't think it makes God look very good whenever carried to its logical conclusion. Oh, and then we got 1 Samuel 23, 10 through 12. This one, I love this one. David said, Lord, God of Israel, your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Keilah and destroy the town on account of me. Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will. Again, David asked, will the citizens of Keilah surrender me and my men to Saul? And the Lord said, they will. None of those things ever actually happened, though. God knew what would happen if certain decisions were made, right? So, I mean, I guess to get around that, are you saying, like, God determined this path, but if, if David was to have been determined to do this, God would have determined for this to happen. Like, it, it doesn't make sense. It's overcomplicated. Just take it as, take it as Scripture almost definitely means it. I'm going to read this comment real quick. Each of which is consistent with one's nature. How then can faith precede regeneration if the mind is governed by the flesh and hostile to God and does not submit to God's law? Indeed, it cannot. I'll get to that later. I will get to that later, so don't worry about that. Um, but yeah, that, that always comes up. <clears throat> but I'm not dodging that. That's... That's down here. <laughs> so, um, talking about God's love. Does God love everyone? Yes, God loves everyone. I think that is plain. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. R.C. Sproul asked and Chosen by God, is God obligated to love everyone? My answer is yes, by virtue of his nature. God is just as obligated to love everyone as he is obligated to be sovereign, as he is to be omnipotent, eternal, all that stuff. It is his nature. I don't want to spend time, oh, Derek, what about Psalm 5-5 that says he hates the workers of iniquity? We're all workers of iniquity. He doesn't hate all of us in that way. I think it's Psalm 11-5 also mentioned hatred. Guys, come on. That, that's, those are psalms. Those are poetic. They're, they're expressionary. They're hyperbolic. Like, we can't build strong doctrines on minor comments in poetry like that. Let's get into Scripture proof texts that often come up in this debate. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 is absolutely one of the Calvinist favorite proof texts. Verses 4 and 5. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his, ple with his pleasure and will. To, to the praise of his glorious grace. Um, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Calvinists see that as he chose us, like he chose from before the foundation of the world, all those that were going to be saved. And he predestined them to adoption, to salvation, essentially. Um, what I like to say to this is, uh, who is this written to? To God's holy people in Ephesus. All right. So there's a context there. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Notice what it doesn't say. It does not say he chose us to be in him. That would, if, if it said that, I mean, you would have more, more to stand on. But it says it chose us in him. In other words, those who are in Christ are chosen for what follows, which is to be holy and blameless in his sight. That's what he's saying. He chose those in Christ. In other, I'm in Christ. So I have been chosen to be holy and blameless right? It's not saying I have been chosen to be saved. So before the foundation of the world, God chose that everyone who was in Christ would be holy and blameless. And then it says, uh, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. That's not, that's not, that's not predestined us to, a, to salvation. It's those in Christ. It's still those who are in Christ are predestined for, for adoption, right? Romans 8, 17 says that we have the spirit of adoption. And then verse 23, it says, uh, we eagerly await our adoption, the redemption of our bodies, right? That's what's meant by adoption. So it's essentially saying that all those in Christ have been chosen to be holy and blameless. That's our sanctification leading up to what we're predestined for, glorification, the redemption of our bodies. So Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, those are, that's just promises to those who are in Christ. And that's what I believe, I think that's a great text on corporate election. All those in Christ, this corporate body, are predestined and chosen for these promises. Okay? Romans 8. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. 
29 through 30. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Calvinists, listen to me right now. I listened to what the Arminians had to say about this. Once again, Calvinists dropped the ball on representing what the Arminian believes. You got to look into it yourself. It, oh, God looks down the corridors of time and is able to throw that away. That's garbage. That's not what the Arminians believe. But uh, none of the Arminians I read agree with me on this, on the interpretation. What I'm going to say is that whenever it comes to Romans 8, 29 through 30, look at verse 28 first. And we know that all things... God works. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What's the next word in verse 29? For. Some translations say because. In other words, I'm carrying this thought. Verse 28, in the same way, the spirit, or, sorry, and we know that in all things, God works out. How do we know that? We know this for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What does foreknowledge mean? Does it mean he looked through the corridors of time to see this? No. Is it the Calvinist rendering where, um, where God from beforehand, eternity past, chose to love, for love certain people and predestined them to be conformed? No. What he's saying is there were people in the past that God loved before this point in time, right? He's talking about Old Testament saints. How do we know? How do we know that all things work together? Because we can look back in time to people who followed Yahweh and what, how God was able to deal with them. So by foreknown, he meant known in the past. These people in the past were known by God. And then what follows is what, what happened to them. And no, I'm not just making this up, this definition of foreknowledge, because uh, Romans 11:2, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. They're talking about Israel, whom he foreknew. He foreknew Israel. In other words, he knew Israel in the past. It's not in the past he knew these people up here. It's saying in the past they were known. So this is a group of people in the past who were known by God, and God predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. That's sanctification leading up to glorification, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God, or Jesus, as, as he was raised from the dead, he, was, he's, uh, he has preeminence over the family of God, those who were saved. He's the firstborn among many brothers because those people in the Old Testament were saved right? It's, it's he, like whenever he, he has preeminence over them, but over many, because those people exist and they were part of God's family. For those who, oh, for, um, and those he predestined, remember predestined, predestined for glorification, predestined to be like, like that's what this, this whole verse unpacks. Uh, for those he predestined, he also called. What does called mean? The Calvinists say the effectual call. No, what he's saying is named. Brian Albashano has this in his dissertation where he talks about how in the New Testament, most of the time, called means to name, right? Sometimes it means a call of the gospel, for many are called but few are chosen, but in cases like this, they're named. They are named as God's people, for he called them his people. That's how you can think about it. Um, he predestined, he also called those he called, he justified and those he justified, he also glorified the glorification there. It's kind of the way I see it is an already but not yet thing, because remember we have the spirit of adoption, but we are still awaiting our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Those people haven't had their bodies redeemed, but they are glorified there in glory with the Lord. They have the already, but not, not the not yet. And so whenever you ask a Calvinist, why is this all in the past tense? Oh, because it's basically just as good as done. It's so guaranteed it's as good as done that he put it in the past tense. No, I... I <laughs> I think that is very ad hoc. It's in the past tense because he's talking about stuff that's already happened to a group of people he foreknew. In other words, knew in the past. So that's Romans 8 for me. Oh gosh. I need to take a drink before I do this next one. Romans 9. R.C. Sproul Jr. says that Arminians skip Romans 9 because they can't handle it. So I'm going to go through Romans 9. I, I, I almost said real quick, but I know that's not true. Everybody knows the first five verses of Romans 9, you know, uh, Paul grieving over his lost people, Israel. Um, he goes on, he talks about like how he would willingly give up his own salvation for their salvation. In Calvinism, you'd have to say that Paul's willing to die for those people, but Jesus isn't. Um, 
The people of theirs is in verse four, he says, theirs is the adoption to sonship. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah who is God over all forever praised. Amen. I read that because that's important because that sets up, believe it or not, that sets up what what we get into starting in verse six, right? Think of it. He just said, it's like earlier in the book of Romans, he said, what advantage does Israel have? He just, he just reiterated it. They had all this stuff, the promises, the patriarchs, the, uh, the temple worship, um, the, the, the lineage that led to the Messiah. Like Israel had all these promises. They had this, this renowned position before God. They were his elect, right? So then we get to verse six. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. What he's saying there is you gotta you gotta understand that that there were Jews, there was Jews and Gentiles within the Roman church, and you know, the Jews were expecting the Messiah to come and save his people, but now the majority of the Jews are not coming to faith. So they're like, so has God's word failed? They they had all these promises. Has God's word failed to save his people? And he said, it is not as though God's word had failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. In other words, there's Israel, but then there's Israel within it. Um, the true Israel, as some people would say, there's always a remnant. Um, Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children, on the contrary. So in other words, what he's saying is, Jews at that time, they had kind of a Jewish snobbery. They thought they were owed certain things because they were descendants of Abraham, including salvation. But he said, he said uh, not all are Abraham's children, or hold on, no, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. In other words, what he's, I don't know why I'm reading that weird, but what he's saying is not everybody who's descended from Abraham was counted in these promises, because Israel has all these promises, and they're like, well, Abraham's our father, and it's like, yeah, but not everybody who's from Abraham had these promises. How do we know this? Because he says, in other words, it is not the children of physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as his offspring, because that was right after he said, it is through Isaac your offspring. So in other words, it wasn't Ishmael, it was Isaac, right? So Ishmael is a descendant of Abraham. He wasn't given these promises. Um, it is not the children by physical descent it, who are God's children, but it is children of promise. Isaac was the child of promise. So the promises of Israel are going to go through Isaac, not Ishmael, or the other six that he had through Keturah. Um, verse 9, for this was how the promise was stated, at the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son. Verse 10, not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac, yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hate it. He's continuing to sing. He's like, it would, like these promises were not given to all of Abraham's descendants, just Isaac. And the same thing carried. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, Isaac had, multi, had two sons. It went through Jacob. It didn't go through Esau, right? God's purpose and election will stand. This, remember what I said, God elected Israel. And so now it says his purpose to election. God chose Israel. He chose Jacob to be the, 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 the carrier of the promise. Jacob and his descendants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He chose that line. He elected that line to, to be the carriers of the promise. Um, yet before the twins had done anything good or bad, in other words, he's saying it had nothing to do with what they did. God chose this. Um, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. Remember, him who calls, what he's talking about is naming them. He named them as his people. Uh, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. The older will serve the younger, that's a quote from Genesis 25. Uh, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, that's Malachi 1. Genesis is the first book of the Old Testament. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. So from beginning to end, that's what this promise represents. This is talking about nations, though, because in Genesis 25, right before it says the older will serve the younger, it says two nations are in your belly. Plus, the person Esau never served the person Jacob. Jacob kneel, like bowed to Esau seven times, right? Um, but Edom served Israel. So that's what he's talking about. Um, Jacob, I loved Esau. I hated. This isn't talking about I hated him in the way that we would use it in our vernacular. He's saying I chose Jacob, not Esau. That's just how they expressed it. Luke fourteen twenty six talks about that, um, and there's other expressions in Scripture to to love one and hate the other does not mean that you adore one and you have a malicious, like grotesque, whatever hatred for the other people. 
and this isn't towards salvation, this is still talking about nations, because Malachi 1 is talking about nations as well. Both contexts are talking about nations. James White, he says, yeah, but the apostolic interpretation makes it individuals, right? But one of the key things about biblical interpretation is you, the old, the, you have to look at how the New Testament uses the Old Testament. Why would Paul go take this, use it differently from how it was used in the Old Testament to make his point? I think that's bad exegesis. I think that's really bad exegesis, actually. Um, Jacob, I love Esau. I hate it. He's talking about the... He chose, he chose Jacob to be the carrier of the promises, not Esau. That's all he's saying. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. So he's saying, is, is God unjust to do this? Think about Malachi. Uh, Edom was destroyed. Israel had just gotten back from, uh, from the, the, the exile. And they're like, how have you loved us, Lord? And he's like, here's how I loved you. Jacob, I loved you. Esau, I hated. Edom was gone. But God, through his mercy, you know, allowed Israel to continue for their promises. So is God unjust? No, not at all. Right? Uh, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom, I'm, whom I have compassion. He's, he's nailing that, that point home. I can, I can have compassion on you. That's a quote from Exodus 33, I think, right after he was intent on destroying Israel, and Moses prays for them, and he's like, okay, I'm relenting that idea, but just know I will have mercy on whom, whom I have mercy. I will have compassion. In other words, he's saying, look, I'm choosing to do this. I didn't owe this to you. I'm choosing to do this, right? It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. In other words, even though somebody like Moses desired Israel to be saved, it, that's not why God did it. God did it because he chose to. He wasn't obligated. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, so now we're using a different example. Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raise you up for this very purpose, that I may display my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed on all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he has mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. So it went from mercy and compassion to now he's talking about mercy and hardening. Right? And people say, oh, well, he's talking about Moses and Pharaoh. So, so, oh, you think he was talking about nations before, but these are individuals. Are they? Moses represented Israel. Pharaoh represented Egypt. Exodus is very explicit that God's judgments were on Egypt, not Pharaoh specifically, even though he, he was the leader of it. So obviously some of it, you know, hit towards him too. But um, for the scriptures, yeah. So, uh, have mercy on whom I have mercy. And harden whom I harden. In other words, he's he's using this because he's because the Jews of that time are hardened. That is why Israel is not accepting their Messiah. They're hardened against him. Remember, J Jesus did this by speaking in parables. John twelve forty talks about that. So they say one of you will say, or Paul says, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who is able to resist His will? Why do you blame us? In other words, it, this is this is a, this isn't a. a anachronistic Arminian asking like, God, why did you determine me for hell and these people for heaven? No, this is a hardened Israelite. And he, this reflects back to like Romans six, when he says, should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? And he's like, no, of course not. And so they're saying like, Hey, if we're fulfilling, you know, what God is wanting to do through our hardening, then why are you blaming us for it? Right. And he says, for who is able to resist his will? And then Paul says, but who are you O human being to talk back to God? In other words, the way I read this, he's like, for who is able to resist his will? And he says, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? So he's saying, what do you mean, who, like, who can resist his will? You're doing it right now. You're answering back to God. I think that goes against his, like, like that is resisting his will by answering back to him whenever he makes a sovereign decision, right? Shall we say, or shall what is formed, or no, but who are you? Yeah. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purpose and some for common use? Now, what we're talking about here, Jeremiah and Isaiah use the potter and clay analogy. It's always about Israel. Everything so far has been Israel. Romans 5, 1 through, or Romans 9, 1 through 5 starts with Israel. I think it carries through Israel all the way. Um, and so we're still, so now he's, sorry, I'm shaking my camera, but now he's using an analogy that Israel would have been f really familiar with, right? And so he says, um, shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purpose and some for common use? Remember that special and common. What do we have with Abraham's children? You have Isaac for, for noble use. You have Ishmael for common use. The same lump of clay. Here's Abraham. He splits it off. This one is for special use. That's Isaac. This one is common use. That's Ishmael. Whenever you have the same lump of clay that was Isaac, you have Jacob and Esau, one for special use, one for common use, right? This isn't about eternal destinies. Uh, 
What if God, and this is where it kind of changes to, to make the whole point of Romans 9 that he's leading up to. What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? In other words, now he's, now he's moving it from, from vessels of special use and common use to glory and destruction. Right? And he endured with them, um, prepared for destruction. Now, is this talking about eternal hell? Some, some people interpret it that way, um, but Israel was rejecting their Messiah. Judgment was coming. It was proclaimed many times. I believe Romans was written in 58 AD. 12 years later, the, the temple and Israel was destroyed. Okay, so it could be talking about that. I, I kind of go with that. Um, what if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even Now, this is the point. He's still talking about Israel. The, 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 what has changed is that those who are included, remember what he said in the beginning of the chapter, not all who are Israel are Israel, right? And so then whenever he says that in the passage, whom prepared for advance glory, uh, he's still talking about the same lump of clay, Right, And one is prepared for glory. Those are believers. Those are believing Israelites. And then he says, even us whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. So it's like, not only is this lump of clay, the faithful Israelites, like being prepared for glory, but the Gentiles are also being grafted into it. This is when Gentiles come into the picture. Um, as it says in Hosea, and then in the very place where I call them, Isaiah cries out, this is verse 27, though the number of the Israelites be like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. In other words, like, like this was no secret. The remnant is being saved. Who are they? The faithful Israelites who believe in Jesus Christ. For the Lord will carry out his sentence with their speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously. Um, we'll skip to verse 30. One thing I noticed, James White in his debate with Leighton Flowers never went this far into Romans 9. Uh, Calvinists oftentimes don't go this far in Romans 9. Ask yourself that why. I'll, I'll, let, I'll leave that to you. What then shall we say, that this is verse 30, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it by faith. They, they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. So in other words, his whole point is that that the reason Israel is hardened is because they're pursuing it by works. They needed to have faith in Jesus Christ, but they rejected their Messiah in lieu, or like for the law, essentially. And so that's the whole point of Romans 9. He's saying, he's basically saying like, like, look, not all of Israel has been Israel. Not everybody who is a descendant of Abraham had these promises, all right? So the fact that Israel at large is being judged and is hardened in rejecting their Messiah, that doesn't mean God's promises fail because the remnant is still being saved. And that's his main point with Romans 9. Whew. John 6. Oh, man. Oh, how long have I been going? I've been going almost an hour. And this is with me cutting out, like, everything I was going to say. I'm just making it purely about where my soteriology is. John 6, starting at verse 37. This might take some explaining as well. Um, All those who the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. That is an important verse in the Potter's Freedom. James White references that verse over and over and over again in his exegesis throughout that whole book. All those the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of the Father, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none, but raise him up at the last day. For the Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And what the Calvinist idea of this is, is that, that Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees, and he's basically saying, like, there's people the Father gives me. Those are the ones who come to me. Right, it's supposed to be a passage on unconditional election. All the Father has given me will come to me. So, you know, I don't have to tell Calvinists what what is meant by that, typically in the Calvinist understanding. But what I will say is all those the Father gives me will come to me. Well, who is the Father giving? I think that's an important question. Um, I personally think that John 17 does kind of bear some some truth to, or uh, some light on this. John seventeen six. I have 
I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. So I think Jesus is talking about the same group of people here, those who were gods. They were gods. They belonged to him. In other words, there were faithful Israelites in the first century when Jesus came. They were gods. They belonged to him because they were faithful Israelites. He gave them to Jesus, and Jesus was um, going to raise them up at the last day. Uh, and I also think that that immediate passage kind of bears us out. Verse 39, or verse 38 tells us that there's an immediate context. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. In other words, what he's doing right here, this context of what he's saying in John 6, is in the context of him coming down from heaven to do this. Jesus didn't come down from heaven to save as many people as he possibly could. He came to accomplish the atonement, right? So, and then verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Verse 40 starts with for, in other words, because, let me read that again. And this is the will of the father who sent me that I shall lose none of those he given me, but raise them up at the last day because the will of my father is that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. In other words, there's a cause and effect there. He's explaining verse 39 with verse 40 that they were believers. I apologize for the phone ringing. And then of course, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the father sent me draws him and I'll raise him up at the last day. Nobody disagrees with that, Armenian traditionalist. I don't know how much you can hear that, but that is really annoying. Uh, but yeah, Arminian, traditionalist, Calvinist, we all believe that there has to be some sort of grace, some drawing of the Father um, in order for people to come to Christ, right? But then in verse 45, it says, <laughs> Sierra, in verse 45, it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. In other words, those who are coming to Jesus are those who are learn and taught by the Father. That's why I think John 17, 6 is relevant. They were gods. They had learned. They were taught and learned from the Father. And so they were gods, and God gives them to Jesus Christ. And this leads me to John 10, because John 10 is also one that people use. That was unconditional election. Now, this John 10 is often used for the sake of uh, limited atonement, because of verses like uh, verse 11, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Right, And then verse 14 through 15, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. They're saying, see, he lays down his life for the sheep. The problem with that is that's a negative inference fallacy to say that he only died for the sheep, right? Just in Galatians 2, I think it is, Paul says that um, Jesus died for me. It doesn't mean he only died for Paul, it just means that he died for Paul. So he died for his sheep, but you can't say he didn't die for anyone else. Um, but then in verse 25 of John 10, Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe me. The works I do in my father's name testify about me, but you do not believe me because you are not my sheep. And so what well, people say, that's unconditional election right there. These Pharisees, they weren't the elect. They weren't God's sheep from before the foundation of the world. They were determined to be goats, not sheep. Sheep will all be saved, right? That like, that's the idea right there. This comes on the back of John 6. Um, they, they were not gods. They had not listened and learned from the Father. They were not his sheep. Why? Is it because a, a decree of God for reprobation before the foundation of the world? No, it's because they didn't listen and learn from the Father. I think it's John 5. I should have been ready for this, but um, I think it's John 5, 40-something. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe me since you accept glory for... But I do not sing, Father, if you believe... Oh, there it is. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote... How are you going to believe what I say? That's why the Pharisees weren't his sheep. They didn't listen and learn properly from the Father. They missed it. They weren't saved. Everybody knows this about the Pharisees. They missed it because they were pursuing righteousness through works. They weren't doing it to be like as a faithful Israelite. So they weren't God's sheep because they weren't faithful. And the whole point, John uh, 10, 4 says, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice, right? That's why they're his sheep. That's why they follow him because they know his voice. And uh, 
uh, verse 27, where are you? My sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me, right? My sheep know my voice. The Pharisees were not his sheep because they did not recognize his voice because they were missing it from their scriptures. They were, they were going to be held accountable to Moses, but they didn't believe Moses, so they missed Jesus Christ. Had they you know, listened and learned properly from the Father, they would have been his sheep because they would have recognized, hey, that voice that Jesus is proclaiming, that voice is the same voice of the Father I read about in the scriptures, but they missed it, and that's why they weren't his sheep. Let me use this opportunity real quick to talk about atonement, limited atonement. Calvinists bring up this idea if Jesus suffered for everybody's atonement, um, if he, if, yeah, if he suffered and was punished for everybody's atonement, then uh, if you go to hell, that's double jeopardy, right? Like if, if Jesus paid your penalty and then you go to hell, that's double jeopardy, right? No, that's not double jeopardy. Double jeopardy is when the same person is convicted of the same crime and punished for it. You can't be punished twice for the same crime. But Jesus and you are not the same person, right? And the way to look at atonement, and I'm, I'm aware of John, John Owen's trilemma. I, I, I know that. I, it's been presented to me. But the answer is Jesus died for all the sins of all humanity. How does that work? If he died for everyone's sins, why is not everybody saved? Because he satisfied the, the, the demands of justice. Penal substitution. He, he was punished in your place on the cross and satisfied God's demands for justice, right? And through that, God offers a pardon through the gospel. And I think the problem with how people kind of parse atonement is they look at the blood of Christ and the atonement as quantitative rather than qualitative. They're like a little bit of blood here, a little bit of blood for that sin. Oh, this, this blood was for this person, but that person wasn't saved, so that blood is wasted. Like, no, that's not how it works. And I, I'm, I'm sort of caricaturizing it just to make my point. But essentially, uh, the blood of Christ is qualitative. He didn't die for this sin and this sin and this person person, you know, a, a, a X number of sins for X number of people. That's not how it works. He died for sin. It was quality. It was a qualitative thing for sin in general. He took care of the problem of sin on the cross, right? And it's through that that God offers a pardon through the gospel. And when you reject it, you're going to be held liable for your sins. So 1 Corinthians 1.18, Jordan, this kind of goes with what you were saying. Um, it'll be in the same vein, honestly, as the Romans 8 thing. Uh, Romans 1.18, Calvinists, or 1 Corinthians 1.18, Calvinists use this, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. What they say is that uh, the gospel is foolishness to anybody who hears it unless you have that effectual call of grace um, on your hearts through, through regeneration. It's going to be foolishness. Let me read it again. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. In other words, they rejected it as foolishness. It's saying they rejected it because they found it to be foolish, not they found it to be foolish because they were rejected by God as being among his sheep, right? But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. In other words, those who are accepting the gospel, it is the power of God, right? And throughout 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, he's, he's, he's contrasting worldly with wisdom with godly wisdom. Whenever you follow the world, the gospel is foolishness. But if you listen and learn from the Father, you see that the gospel is a beautiful truth. The other, the other verse Calvinists often use is 1 Corinthians 2.14. And this is why they say man can't accept the gospel. Like, he has to be regenerated first. They'll use a passage like this. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. And they'll say, see, you can't, the gospel is a spiritual truth, and so they can't accept the gospel because the gospel can only be spiritually discerned. You have to have the Spirit in order to believe the gospel. Um, ben Stanhope has talked about this. Like, like no... The way the first part, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. In other words, he does understand them, but he rejects them. But also, remember, 1 Corinthians 2 starts out, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you. I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's not saying like, oh, it's because this is the most important, though it is. He's saying this was as basic as I could be with you guys. I had to be very basic. And how do I know that? Because he, he goes on to talk about the deeper things of God, which I forget which verse. It's before verse 14. Speaking of what's up. Yeah, it's somewhere in there, but he talks about the deeper things of God. He didn't teach the Corinthians the deeper things of God. He kept it basic with the, just the gospel. 
I, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, because that's simple, right? And then he goes on in, ver in chapter 3, starts out, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are of the flesh, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. The, pe the very people he says that, that, that um, he's saying, you're not spiritual. So what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 2.14, that applied to the Corinthians. Like they weren't able to grasp the deeper things of God because they were still fleshly and they weren't spiritual, right? That's what he's saying. He's not saying that you're born in a certain condition like this. And I think Romans 8, 7, and 8 kind of goes with the same thing, but also it's just the fact that, oh, I'm a slave to sin. That doesn't mean you can't realize your bondage and cry out for help. Um, it does, like, uh, the, the, you know, uh, Hebrews eleven six. 6, for it is impossible without faith to please God. It's not that the faith pleases God. It's just that um, without faith, you can't please God. But, I mean, it implies that you can't have faith, right? you got to do something in faith, but it doesn't imply you can't have faith. Um, and there's another verse, yeah, Romans 7 through 8. It's the same thing. It doesn't mean just because your, 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 your nature is to go this way, it doesn't mean you can't have a moment where you make a good decision, right, to trust God. In fact, I would say that whenever you have gone that way for so long, you start to realize you can't do it and you cry out for help. All right, so that's why I'm not a Calvinist. This is where I get to talk about Arminianism a little bit. <laughs> Um, I also don't consider myself an Arminian because this, this pesky little thing called grace, and I'm still figuring it out. I told you guys, I've read books on soteriology, but I am just getting started. When it comes to grace, it comes down to what is the nature of grace. You have the Calvinist idea. I mean, there's common graces, but then there's the irresistible effectual grace. Um, with Arminianism, you have, uh, Prevenient grace. With traditionalism, which is what I identify with, you still have prevenient grace, but it's more, I'll, I'll explain it in a second, a grace that comes beforehand. That They all believe in that, but the nature of grace. Whenever I debated Catholics for like four years, they would talk about grace as if it was a substance, like you had to acquire more and more grace on your account. You know, if you acquired so much, it would it would be less time in purgatory, or you could earn this grace for this person in purgatory, and these different sacraments were dispensaries of grace. Like, you just had to get all this grace, you know, like it was a substance you had to acquire and, you know, grow in and, you know, like, like money. Uh, coming out of the Reformation, they don't talk about grace like, like Calvinists and Arminians. I don't think they talk about grace as if it's a, a substance, but more like it's a force, right? Like God reaches into you in a spiritual way in the ethereal plane of existence and does, he applies this force to you that, that we call grace. Calvinists call it effectual grace. Arminians call it provenient grace, right? I just don't think that's what it is. I, I, and, I, and you're like, oh, Derek, you're mischaracterizing. Am I? Because I can show you the sermon where John MacArthur says grace is, you need to think of grace as a force, a divine force that is applied to people. He literally called grace a force. But I'm not interested in what, what you know, creeds and catechisms and all that stuff from the Reformation era define grace as. Well, I'm, I'm interested, what did the biblical authors think of grace? Whenever they said the word grace, what did they think about? Was it this force that's applied to you, right, inside your inner being that can partially regenerate you, which some, not all Armenians believe, or at least enables you to be able to believe, or the Calvinist that guarantees it's efficacious to where you will believe. I think I'm kind of on the, the bandwagon, if you will, of grace needs to be thought of in terms of patron-client reciprocity. Weird words, I know. But in the first century... My understanding is that grace was thought of as a person did something or gave something to somebody who didn't deserve it. It was just purely out of the kindness of their heart. And in turn, that person would give them honor. That was grace back then. As my understanding, I haven't looked into it a lot. So whenever I talk about, I, I can't be an Arminian because they have prevenient grace. I'm just... I'm just not quite there. I, I, just, I just don't see it that way. So what is grace in the context of scripture? God's creation that attests to his glory, that was gracious because it attests to him, right? God sending Jesus Christ to atone for us, that was something he did for us, right? That was grace. Um, whenever he uh, sends prophets to turn people back to the Lord, whenever uh, he sends uh, the apostles out, whenever he, he had people write scripture, we have the preservation of scripture. These are all actions of grace that God gave to us that we didn't deserve, we didn't earn, and in return, we are expected to honor him, 
right? And I think that's more like what grace is talking about. So whenever you hear the gospel, like that was a gracious act. And so you hear the gospel, the gospel, Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, right? The gospel has the power, right? Hebrews 4, 12, you know, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing uh, bone and marrow and uh, spirit and soul, butchering it. But you get what I'm saying? Like the word of God ha is itself this grace that is given to us by which we can believe. And remember what I said about John 20, 31, where are you? But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These are written so that you may believe. Scripture itself was an act of grace God gave to us so that we can believe. So I, I think that's where I'm at right now. I have books on my Amazon wish list about provenient grace. So if David Paulman sees this and he's biting his tongue ready to jump on me and say, oh, did you know our mini? Look, look, I get it. I get it. I haven't, I haven't searched it out completely. Calvinists are pretty consistent on effectual, irresistible grace. So uh, I'm almost done, I promise. Assurance and security. What's often thought by Calvinists is that they have the assurance of salvation and Armenians have no assurance of salvation. And then there's the traditionalist, which is oftentimes equated with eternal security. Where, Derek, where do you stand on the eternal security? It's not going to be that easy. <laughs> um, but I will say this. I want... I know I'm going to ruffle feathers with this on everybody's camp, but I once heard a sermon from Paul Washer and he said that somebody could serve the Lord faithfully for 20 years of his life and serve the Lord faithfully, just doing all sorts of works for the Lord. He could serve him faithfully for 20 years of his life. But if that last year of his life, he starts living for himself in the world, that one year was more proof he was never saved than the 20 years prior. And I hear that. I'm like, where's the assurance of self? salvation there. For 20 years, he served the Lord faithfully, but he was never saved that whole time, right? And so it, it, the question comes up, how do I know? I'm serving the Lord with my life. I'm running with him. How do I know in 10 years that won't be me? How do I know that, right? And so I do think there is a convenient ad hoc explanation from the Calvinist with the perseverance of the saints. Oh, they didn't persevere. They were never saved. Right. But how do you know you're, how do you know that's not going to be you? Even R.C. Sproul talks about in, 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 in a book, I forget what it is. Dave Hunt uh, quotes it, but he had a moment where he was like, what if I'm not actually elect? And it was like a crisis of faith in that moment. Like he was dripping with sweat, like considering what if I'm not elect? Right. So no, Calvinists do not have the corner on assurance of salvation. Um, Arminians, they have more assurance than you would than you would think. And once you read Arminians, you'll understand this. Arminians do have assurance of salvation. They absolutely do because they don't believe that you can just send it away or that you're just guessing. Like that's more like Catholics. Arminians, as long as you believe in Jesus Christ, you are saved. As long as you have faith. If you come to a place where you absolutely reject and turn away from the faith and say, I want nothing to do with that, I'm done, I'm leaving. They say that's whenever you can apostatize and not be saved any longer. But that's not something you accidentally fall into, right? It's basically, as long as you're believing, you're, you're, you're good. If you, Michael Heiser says it. He's not an Arminian, but he says, if you believe, you're eternally secure. If you don't, you're not. And then you have the eternal security. Let's use Ravi Zacharias as an example here, right? Calvinists will usually say Ravi was never saved to begin with because he didn't finish strong. He didn't persevere to the end. He did egregious acts of sin for the last 10 years of his life and died unrepentant, right? So yeah, he didn't finish strong. He didn't persevere to the end, so he was never saved. But then what do you do with his ministry before all that sin, the amazing things his ministry did? Are you saying he was never saved throughout that whole time? That's hard to swallow, right? But then you have the eternal security advocates. They can go that route, or they'll say, it doesn't matter, he's still saved. It's like... <laughs> It's hard to see the justice in that. It really is. And I get it. God died for our sins. Like, I, I get it. But it, it's just, but then the Arminian would say, no, like, Ravi, he may have been saved, but he did not, his life up to his death showed that he was not a follower of Jesus. So he is not saved. I think the Arminian has a better explanation there. I do. It just makes more sense to me. You can disagree. It's fine. But all three camps, all three camps, provisionist, traditionalist, or same thing. Uh, Calvinist and Arminian, you are, if, if you believe, you are saved. If you believe, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are saved. You are not going to send it away. You did not work for your salvation. You're good. 
as long as you believe you're good. And that it doesn't mean, oh, I can't have a doubt. No, like they believe apostasy, willful rejection and turning away. That's where the d disagreement is. So let me address a few talking points and then I'm done. Uh, Calvinists often bring up, did God fail? If the atonement didn't save, if God desires all to be saved and all are not saved, did God fail? Uh, no, no, not at all. Um, James White says that the atonement will save everybody who it was designed to save. He says something like that. I'm like, I agree. I fully agree with that. The atonement is going to save everybody it was intended to save. Who was it intended to save? James White will say the elect chosen from before the foundation of the world. I will say believers. That's, that's who it was intended to save. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him. That was his will. That whoever believes will be saved. And so God doesn't fail in that respect. But oh, but God wants people to be saved, but not everybody is saved. Look, even Calvinists will have that. Even some Calvinists will say, yeah, there is a desire on God's part for all to be saved, but he has this secret will. That's his revealed will, but his secret will, which I don't know how you can know his secret will if it's a secret, but his secret will is that he has a, a larger purpose for it to where uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't save them. Okay, I believe in two wills of God too. They're called antecedent and consequent wills of God. And so we even have antecedent and consequent wills where God desires us to be saved as like, that's the antecedent. He desires all to be saved, but as a consequent will, it's, but because of his, that's his love. His love says that I want everybody to be saved, but his justice demands that only believers can be saved, right? And so he can desire all to be saved and not all be saved, right? It's, it's not that God failed. And then, you know, R.C. Sproul brings up, like I said, he, he asks and chosen by God, does God owe people love? No, he doesn't owe people love, but by his nature, he's going to give it. That's just how God is. He's, God is sovereign. God is omnipotent. God is eternal. God is love. So yes, it's not about him owing us love, but he's going to give it by virtue of his nature. So then they say, does God owe us grace? Nobody believes that God owes us grace because then it's not grace. It's just that by nature, God is, God has told us by his nature, he's going to extend grace to people. There is no, and back to Romans 9, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and I'll harden whom I'll harden. There is no mystery on who he's going to do that with. Scripture says that he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. All the time throughout scripture, it says these merciful people will get mercy. Like it's no secret who God has mercy on. He tells us that, that doesn't mean he's obligated, but he's, he, he also doesn't keep it a secret. So I didn't really get any interaction. I think so, gosh, I went an hour and 20 minutes. That was my short version. I'm going to go live here in a little bit as well. Not, not today, but in a few days, just to give my thoughts about the soteriology debate in general. I cut all of that out. I cut out proof texts. If you're like, oh, what about this proof text? I cut it out. I tried to do as many as I could, and I, cut, I just did the big ones, and I still went an hour and 20 minutes. So, anyway, my voice is hoarse. Thanks for tuning in, everybody who's watching. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to put this on YouTube, but uh, appreciate you guys uh, letting me talk your ear off today. Good thing you speak quickly. Yeah, tell me about it. This is practice, too. All right, so hope you all have a good day. Calvinists, I love you. Each and every one of you, Arminians, I love you. And my fellow traditionalists, love you, too. <laughs>